welcome to the Pacific Research Institute podcast. I'm your host, Rowena Itchell. In this episode, we have a special guest, Andy Puzder, the former CEO of CKE Enterprises, better known as Carl's Jr. and Hardy's. CKE was founded by the legendary California entrepreneur Carl Karcher. Andy Puzder recently spoke at a joint PRI Lincoln Club event at the California Club in Los Angeles. He's out with his first book, Capitalist Comeback, The Trump Boom and the Left's Plot to Stop It. Andy Puzder, who has worked his way up from minimum wage jobs to run an international business, has a first-hand view of how America's exceptional capitalist spirit can lift people to success. We think you'll enjoy this. Thank you for coming, Mr. Puzder. You dedicated Capitalist Comeback to Carl Karcher, the founder of Carl's Jr. and, and one of California's great entrepreneurs. For our listeners who may not be familiar with him, could you tell us about Carl's Jr.'s story and how you became involved? Absolutely, Rowena, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, Carl Karcher was the founder of the Carl's Jr. restaurant chain. Uh, As a young man during the Great Depression, he moved to California uh, from the family farm in Ohio. Uh, He was one of eight kids, and I don't think they had enough to feed everybody, so he he needed to to move on and find a better life, and he came to California looking for that better life. Uh, He got a job as a bread truck driver and noticed that he was delivering a lot of hot dog buns to a particular hot dog cart that was outside the Goodyear Tire Plant in South Central Los Angeles. This is just before World War II, so during the week there'd be a lot of people working there, and on weekends uh, people would go to see the Goodyear Blimp, which was parked there. That hot dog cart came up for sale, uh, Carl took his car and went to a bank and used it as collateral to borrow $311. Uh, his wife had $15 she'd been saving in her purse, and together they, they uh, put that $326 towards buying the hot dog cart. Within four or five years, Carl had five or six hot dog carts, a few more years, and he had a, a restaurant in Orange County called Carl's Drive-In Barbecue. And then in 1956, he opened his first Carl's Jr. hot dog stand. I met Carl in 1986 in connection with a lawsuit he had in, um, in Missouri. I was practicing law in St. Louis. Carl and I became very good friends. Um, he brought me on as his full-time attorney, had me move to California uh, to represent him personally, not the company. I became general counsel of the company in 1997 and CEO in 2000. And by the time I left as CEO in 2017, that hot dog cart had grown into over 3,800 restaurants in 45 states and 40 foreign countries, and a restaurant system that generated over $4 billion in revenue. So Carl was the quintessential self-made American and, um, and you know, it has done a lot of good for a lot of people. Well, you know, everyone who's grown up in California knows about Carl's Jr. in one of our, our favorite spots. So one of your goals in, in writing this book is to highlight the economic gains during the Trump administration and to try to and to try and counter the left's attempts to discredit these achievements. Is it all politics or do you think the left is just they just can't admit that free market policies work? Well they, they really can't admit that free market policies work. And I think John Kennedy probably summarized it best when he said um, in, in, in an effort to get really massive tax cuts to generate economic growth, because there'd been a number of recessions just prior to his presidency. Uh, But to generate economic growth, he wanted to get tax cuts, and he came out with a speech. It's on YouTube. It's very inspiring. But one of the things he says is that a rising tide lifts all boats. And what he's referring to is a rising economic tide. It lifts the poor. It lifts the working class, the middle class, the upper class. It makes everybody better off. It's really the beauty of America and the beauty of free market capitalism. The problem is it eliminates the need for class warfare. And when you, because everybody, wealth isn't a zero sum game. In other words, the rich don't get richer only because the poor get poorer. The fact is, capitalism and economic growth can make everybody's life better. So if you lose the need, if you lose that need for class warfare, you lose the justification for socialism. And the Democrats have become the party of the, you know, the Democrats, the progressives, the socialists. I mean, it's all one term now. They're, they don't even try and hide it anymore. Uh, so you, you really, with, with, what Kennedy did and what capitalism does is it puts the lie to the notion uh, that class warfare is either necessary or desirable and therefore a lie to the notion that we need socialism. Everybody's lives improves under free market capitalism. There's never been an economic system that's lifted more people from the working class to the middle class or lifted more people out of poverty than free market capitalism. So they need to do whatever they can to stop it. So how about discussing some of Trump's achievements? 
Well, it's been pretty incredible. I, this isn't something that a lot of people are familiar with. I mean, everybody knows, everybody's heard that the unemployment rate is at a 20-year low. It hasn't been this low since the turn of the century. Uh, there are numbers that people are out there talking about. But generally, uh, the Democrats will try and give some credit to President Obama, which he doesn't deserve at all, by the way. If, if Trump had continued President Obama's policies, then you could say President Obama's do some of the credit here. But in fact, President Trump reversed all of uh, President Obama's economic policies. He, he decreased instead of increasing taxes. He reduced regulation. He opened American energy. And what the result has been, we now have more people working full time uh, than uh, in the history of the country, 129 million people in May, the most recent numbers we have. Uh, it's never been that high. And the, the people who are working part time for economic reasons, in other words, they can't find full time jobs, is under 5 million people. It hasn't been under 5 million people uh, since March of 2008. So we're seeing really significant improvements in the quality of jobs. We've also had for the first time uh, in the history of the government of the Bureau of Labor Statistics keeping track of the data, we've had more job openings in uh, March than we had people unemployed. That had never happened before. And then it happened again in April uh, where you've got more people um, you've got more people, businesses looking for workers than you have workers looking to find jobs. Uh, so the number, we've got 150, over 155 million people employed in the United States. That's the highest number of people that have ever been employed in the United States. And the number of people that are unemployed is the lowest it's been since December of 2008. So the, for, for the American people, these are tremendous numbers. Let's, let's take one ex industry as an example. Let's take manufacturing. Five, the, Following the recession, when the recession began, manufacturing jobs plummeted. They dropped very significantly. Uh, and they hit bottom, rock bottom, around January of 2010. From January of 2010 to the end of his administration, uh, the manufacturing sector added about 11,000 jobs a month on average. So there were jobs created coming out of the recession. But the last two years of the Obama administration, that trend uh, took a significant uh, reversal. There were about 5,300 manufacturing jobs created in 2015 on average, and we actually lost 2,750 manufacturing jobs on average in 2016. So the trend was, had definitely gone negative. In the 17 months that President Trump has been in office, that number has resurged where we've added 19,000 manufacturing jobs a month just since he became president. So we're now actually in a situation with, with uh, full-time jobs increasing, uh, with, with, with jobs in sectors like working class sectors, like manufacturing, like transportation with truck drivers, like construction, all have tremendous job openings. We've actually gone from an economy 17, 18 months ago under President Obama, where the biggest problem was people were dropping out of the labor force because they, they, they couldn't find good quality jobs. To the point now, in 17 months, this is the capitalist comeback, where the biggest problem is businesses are unable to find enough people to fill the open good quality jobs. So we've really turned the economy 180 degrees. It's, it, it's absolutely tremendous. Now, how do you think the turnaround came so quickly? Well, it came a lot more quickly than I thought it would. But first of all, cutting regulations. I, you know, I thought we'd get a turnaround, but I didn't think we'd get exactly. it before the midterms. Right, right. Uh, I mean, cutting regulation immediately. See, the, the economy, in retrospect, the economy had been repressed like somebody had their hand on a spring. And while the Obama administration was trying to, I don't know what they were trying to do, but increasing regulations and increasing taxes and refusing to allow America to develop its energy resources, as soon as, they, as, soon as the hand was lifted and American businesses knew they were no longer going to be repressed, they were no longer going to be prevented from earning a profit or making a profit, no longer being stopped from growth, when that hand came off the spring, it just sprung. Uh, and then with the tax cuts on top of it, and then with the energy production on top of that, we've just seen the kind of tremendous economic growth you can only see uh, when the American free enterprise system is set loose and America's entrepreneurs are allowed to do what they do best, which is grow, create jobs, create wealth, spread prosperity, and really make this a better country. We are the envy of the world. We are the best country in the history of the world in which somebody could live if they're looking for success, prosperity, and an optimistic future. Uh, now, you worked your way through college <laughs> at a minimum wage job. Um, how did that experience influence your views on work as a CEO and your views on labor policy? 
I mean, I worked, I, I worked a bunch of different jobs. I mean, I painted houses, I did landscaping, I busted up concrete in uh, the middle of the summer in St. Louis, Missouri, and threw the chunks on the back of a truck. And if you've ever been to St. Louis in the middle of the summer, you'll know what a miserable job that was. But I, I really always felt, the important thing was that I always felt that there was nothing standing between me and my dreams and what I wanted to do other than my willingness to do the work I needed to do to get there. There was no government in the way. Nobody was going to stop me. I could go as far as my abilities and my uh, desire would take me. And that influenced me uh, as a CEO greatly. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a CEO who, unlike many others who grew up affluent, I did not. I grew up working class. I did not have government or family support to get through college, I knew what it meant to get to the end of the month and maybe not have enough money to make rent or to feed your family. I had a wife and two kids and my wife was pregnant when I graduated from law school. So I'd, been, I'd lived the experience of the working class American and I was very sensitive to their needs. I wanted to make sure that they had job opportunities, uh, that, that we didn't price them out of job opportunities because there's nothing more meaningful than an opportunity to work. Uh, but I also wanted to make sure there were as many jobs as possible. So I, I did whatever I could to make sure that the country and our business fostered policies that would encourage economic growth, business growth, and job growth. You know, there's a, there are a lot of young people living in the inner cities now without a lot of opportunity and unskilled workers who have lost their jobs to either technology or to other countries. Government has been trying to address this issue for a long time now without a lot of success. Can, can you discuss your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, first of all, government trying to address it during the Obama administration was really, a, it, it, I don't want to say it was a waste of time, but it was a very difficult assignment. Because without, without economic growth, you know, training people for job opportunities that don't exist uh, or a minimal number of job opportunities, clearly not enough for all the people that were looking for jobs, you were kind of on a fool's errand. You're really, there, even if you trained people, there was nothing that you could train them for. So I think that's a problem. Uh, secondly, the inner cities, that was a focus that I wanted to uh, make had I been confirmed as Secretary of Labor. I wanted to work uh, with uh, uh, particularly inner city communities to try and create opportunities uh, for minority kids in, in, the, um, uh, in an entrepreneurial sense. So I'll tell you, the proudest day of my working career was when I was scooping ice cream at Baskin Robbins. I started when I was 16. When I was 17, the franchisee that owned the Baskin Robbins I worked in called me into her office and handed me the key and said, you got a 10 cent raise. That was from a dollar to a dollar 10. And uh, here's a key you can open in the morning and you can close at night when you're here. And I, I'll tell you that next morning I opened and I've got to tell you, I think within a half an hour, that was the cleanest Baskin Robbins in the United <laughs> States of America because you had such a feel, it was such a feeling of accomplishment that I'd really done something that I could move forward. And that's the kind of thing that keeps you connected to your family, keeps you in school, keeps you working, you know, keeps you out of gangs, keeps you off the street. And we need, we need that in, in our inner cities that people need to feel that there is a hierarchy they can ascend, a ladder of opportunity they can climb, and that there's nothing that's going to stop them. There's not, and in the inner city, I don't think many kids feel they're part of that, that hierarchy, that they feel like they're on that ladder of opportunity. So I think what we need to do is connect the jobs and training programs that we have, particularly in the inner cities, but urban communities now too. The, the, economic, the, the miserable economic growth during the Obama years, about 2%. Uh, also devastated job growth in rural communities, which is one of the reasons I believe you're seeing this opioid crisis is you're feeling people who can't find jobs going on drugs. So, but in the inner city, in the rural communities as well as the inner city, we need to connect American businesses who know how to train people for the jobs that are open, who know what job openings there are, who know what they need and what they want, and are at this time having a difficult time finding people. We need to take the money we spend as a federal government to supplement what American businesses are doing. I think they spend three or four times as much on job training as the government does. But we should supplement that. We shouldn't try and compete with it. We should try and get people into the workforce and work with the private sector to get people trained and get people working. So you alluded to this earlier. One of the biggest problems we have now for employers is the need for high-skilled workers. We can't find enough employees to hire. How do we address this issue? Again, you, you've got to work with employers. For example, Silicon Valley is is, hard, is having a hard time finding employees, even if they've graduated from college, you know, with, with relevant degrees. Right. And the reason is because if you could teach kids 
the skills they need to work in Silicon Valley, you'd be working in Silicon Valley. I mean, you wouldn't be hanging out at a college or a community college trying to teach these kids uh, how to do something where you could make a tremendous amount of money yourself. So if, so if we work with those businesses to try and get them to help train people for the jobs they need, they've got the skill sets. They know what they're looking for. If we can bring, if we can cooperate with them, and, and you know, this, this is a, a real threat, I think, to the academic community in America. Uh, and and they're, you know, they're very well unionized, they're very well organized. But I think, what the, I think the result is destructive for American workers. We need a partnership between American businesses and our academic institutions to try and make sure that we're actually training people or giving people educations that lead to jobs. Now, that doesn't mean everybody needs a skills-based education. Some people may want to major in history or, or philosophy or poetry. I majored in history. I, you know, it's, th those are good educations to get. But if we're going to, if people want jobs, if they want to enter into this more skills-based type industries, I think we need to work with the private sector and get uh, more get more contribution from their side uh, it's with respect to what the government's doing. Now, let's turn to California and its problems. And yeah. Businesses don't want <laughs> to settle here. How long is this interview? <laughs> uh, I know. You know, businesses don't want to settle here. The middle class is moving out due to the lack of affordable housing, poor quality schools, uh, transportation gridlock, um, just the general high cost of living. Uh, it's been difficult to change policy when the state is dominated by leftist politicians. Could you share your thoughts on this? How can we even make a, how can we turn California around when the left dominates the state? Uh, it's very, very difficult. We're going to need a real, a real paradigm change here. Something very significant needs to happen because with, well, it's a very wealthy state and I think the sixth largest economy in the world, it has the highest rate of poverty in the United States. Income inequality is, if it's not the highest, it's among the highest in the United States because people in the middle keep leaving. And what you end up with is a large number of poor people and a large number of very wealthy people and then the accountants, lawyers, shopkeepers that take care of these, these wealthy individuals. So until, and, and, and the, the votes continue to be for an expanded welfare state, an expanded socialist state. As long as you have those kinds of forces working, it, it, it's, uh, you're never really going to reduce income inequality. You're never going to create the kind of opportunities that lift people from the working class to the middle class or lift people out of poverty because socialist programs don't do that. They claim to do that, but they really become government dependency programs that don't give people the kind of self-satisfaction and self-worth and opportunity that you need. We need those, that, that, the, that hierarchy that you can ascend. We need that ladder of opportunity. And increasingly in California, that ladder of opportunity is having rungs removed uh, where people get to a certain point and they can't go any higher because the opportunities are so far less than they are in other parts of the country, which is why people are moving to states like Texas, like Tennessee, like Nashville, that, that really have more opportunity and governments that are friendlier to business type concepts. How you fix California, you know, until people realize that they're on a bad path here, and I don't know what kind of event it's going to take them to realize that, but until that event occurs, I think you've got serious problems. That's why I left. For Tennessee, is that correct? For Tennessee, right. yes. We moved to the Nashville area. Now, uh, I wanted to mention that the profits from your book are going to charity. Could you tell us about this decision, and are there particular charities that the funds will go to? Well, a couple things. One is I, I, I wanted, look, I really have, I've been very successful. I owe this country a lot. I thought I'd pay it back through government service, but that uh, for reasons that some Democrat, some Republican senators will have to explain to me someday. That just didn't happen. But um, I, with the book, I want to give back to the country. It's, I, the idea wasn't that I would make a big profit. I'm not James Comey. I'm not, you know, this isn't like a higher royalty. This is a, a Andy Puzzer trying to, to, to share some knowledge, particularly with younger Americans, high school and college age, who aren't, who aren't learning the kinds of things that are in the book in school. And so I wanted to make sure that um, people didn't say, oh, Puster's just doing this so he can make more money. I'm not. Even though the book's called The Capitalist Comeback, all the money's going to go towards a charity or more than one charity that encourage entrepreneurship in the minority community. Uh, why that? Well, I, I think that's an important area. I think we need to get people in those minority communities to feel like they're on that. Again, there, there is that hierarchy, that are, there is that ladder of opportunity. Uh, so I'm going to contribute money to that kind of charity. Now, I haven't identified a charity, 
because I don't want people not buying the book because they don't like the charity. And I don't have, I prefer people not buy the book because I'm supporting a particular charity. I would like people to buy the book because um, what's in it is, is worthwhile knowing. I think it's a, uh, it's a book that it, people that have read it, I've, I've gotten very, very positive comments from about, uh, uh, and uh, I just want to make sure that people read it and don't think I wrote it to make a bunch of money. Finally, since PRI's headquarters is near California wine country and we love wine at PRI, it's been our tradition to ask all of our podcast guests at the end of the episode for a wine, beer, or cocktail recommendation for our listeners. So what have you been enjoying while you've been here in California? Well, personally, I love Maris wines. Uh, Maris is a winery up in Napa Valley, so up, up by you guys. Um, that's one of my favorite wines anywhere in the world. It's owned by uh, Bill Foley, who owns uh, a number of wineries up there, and uh, that's one of my favorites. Personally, I'm a a, uh, a dirty martini drinker uh, <laughs> with Tito's vodka, So, <laughs> oh, but I, I don't drink a lot of those. I probably drink more wine than I do. I try and hold the martinis off. You know, you know I'm, I'm 68. It's time to slow that stuff down. Any particular Maris wine? Well, I, you, know, the, you know their cabs are great. Cabs. Uh, yeah, they're, it's a it's a very it's a strong wine. I mean, it's a a rich wine. Uh, but yeah, but I, and I love Pinot too. There's so many good wineries up there. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks to our guest Andy Puzder, and do buy his book Capitalist Comeback on Amazon or a bookstore near you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes. Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for another episode of PRI's podcast.